So let me tell you a little bit about tonight's speaker. So Kevin is the founder and CEO of Independence Title. And as I mentioned, we co-authored a book called Title Insurance Tips and Secrets a couple of years back. Um, I've been working on closings with Kevin since 2003. In fact, the guy that trained me in real estate, Ben, he used to have his office the first NLC Financial off of Hillsborough Road, and he used to have his office over Fairway Drive. And on the first house that I bought, we went over to Independence, and, and Ben, my real estate mentor, introduced me to Kevin. Ever since then, we've done hundreds, I mean probably pushing, I would, I would imagine if you added up the volume of the wholesalers, we're probably north of a thousand deals with Independence title, and um, you know, how many years later are we now? 14 years later? And uh, we're still doing closings with them every single day. Our students are still doing closings with them. So uh, Kevin's probably got one of the, I would probably say the largest Florida-based title company for investors in the state of Florida. Uh, so if you look at a wholesale, fix and flip, flip, double flip, optional fund, land trust, any of that, then that's where you want to be. So how about Without further ado, we give a nice warm welcome to Kevin. Thank you, sir. How's everyone doing? All right, we're going to need some energy in the room because I just flew in on a red eye from Vegas and uh, I need to make sure you keep me alert here because we know the world of insurance is a boring topic to most. To me, I'm passionate about it and I love it and hopefully I'm going to educate you a little bit. Hopefully, I'm going to scare you a little bit to learn some of the things that you can avoid. Because the reality is, is that you do not get the opportunity to choose the title company a lot of times. If you're buying REO property, short sales. So you need to learn some tips and tricks to avoid lawsuits, fraud, title claims. Uh, and we're gonna cover that as we go on uh, through the day. Sound good? Yes. Sound good? Yes. All right, awesome. So what do you wanna learn today? Does anyone have anything specific you want to learn that you came here, you said, you know what, I want to know this? No one? How to be as confidential as possible in the market. How to be confidential as possible. So that, we are going to cover that, and that's going to lead into my two rules. First rule is just silence your cell phones, put them on vibrate. If you have to take a call, please just go take it outside. Don't take it in here because it disrupts the person sitting next to you. Got it? Rule number two, I'm going to give you a lot of advice. The advice I'm going to give you is 15 plus years of buying, selling, lending. Uh, I hold the uh, real estate license. I'm going to give you years of experience, but there's one thing I cannot give you, and what's that? Legal advice, okay? I'm just the title company. I'm not a real estate attorney. I'm not an accountant. I'm going to give you just years of experience, mistakes that I have made. As Lex said, which I appreciate when I, and I like when he says it, is his mentor was closing with me. And it's so nice to see that evolve to where the mentor brought the student, the student became the mentor and now brings more students. And even some of those students have become mentors. That's pretty amazing just to see in 15 years of me doing this, to see the evolution of people and how their lives are changing. Many of you came here today because you want a new opportunity in life. You want to just learn how to make money like everyone else, and it's consistency. That's why Lex said, I show up at every meeting, every month, I don't miss a meeting. If I can't make it, I send someone from my office. Because if I miss one meeting, it sets me back three or four months. Out of sight, out of mind, right? So you're all here, you took some action. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself, just to give up a little bit about my family, my life, how I got into this business why I do what I do, and then we'll get into the good stuff. Sound good? Yeah. Awesome. So some of you know my story, some of you don't. How many of you have never seen me speak before? Okay, so a bunch of you. So many years ago, I was a firefighter. I was a firefighter for six years. I went up the ranks all the way up to a captain, and then I just got tired of it. And I moved to Florida 20 days before 9-11. I signed my lease August 20th, of 2001 right here. And, and I knew a few people that, that I lost up there. And one of the things that, that my wife and I, we always would talk about it, and we figure, how do we transition my passion for what I was doing? Because believe me, 
I would love to go out there and drive that fire truck down the street. I would love to burn into, run into that burning building because I had such a passion for helping people because firefighters and police officers don't do it for the money. They do it because they truly enjoy what they do. It's crazy. Some of them are crazy for what they do, but they do it because they want to save lives. So we thought, how do we transition this into what we do? And my wife, being the intelligent one, said, you stick together with your clients. You go in the deal together, you leave the deal together, and you leave no one behind. And that's what we do. That's what we've trained our staff. We train them to go in the deal together and leave the deal together. So you know when we're here, we're going to give you the best advice we can get because if we don't close, guess what happens? We don't make any money, right? It's not like I'm charging you a, a retainer for, for legal advice. If I don't close your deal, I make nothing. So it's very important for us to make sure we can get in the deal together and then we can get out of the deal together because what do you get in the end? A check, right? How many of you want to leave with a check? Right? That's what you're here to learn. So that's a little bit about that. Some of my hobbies, anything to do with water, I've done some pretty crazy things. Most, actually all of these are since I met my wife. I was pretty boring before I met her. But I've done some pretty crazy things. So I love anything to do with water, fishing, and then most recently, I, w I was actually 285 pounds, and I got into these uh, Spartan mud run races. And uh, I love it. We're actually building. How many of you have seen American Ninja Warrior, the show, right, on NBC? We're building a ninja course in our office. So in the back garage of our office, that was me doing the uh, salmon ladder that you see these crazy people do. So I was able to accomplish it, and then I got the idea to build one. So we're actually building one at our office. So it's going to be pretty cool. My wife's in the back of the room. Everyone can turn and say hello. You know, one of the important things that, that I love to share is that if you do not have a partner, whether it's a business partner, your spouse, significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, that believes in what you're doing, get out. Because you will never truly be successful if they're stopping you. Okay? Because if fear is going to kill you, it's going to be worse when fear is killing them. So you need to have a partner that believes in everything you do. And we have the conversation all the time because we probably talk 95% business. Every conversation is tied to business somehow. So it's very important to have someone that can think outside the box, someone that's intelligent to have these conversations with you, someone that comes to your meetings. I know Steve's here all the time and, and, and his significant others with him. And it's about having the support in order to reach the next level because that's what we're all here to do today. We do a lot with charity. Kids in Distress is one of the, the big ones that we do. For any of you that know the events we go to, we've sponsored, we've taken 80 kids to the Miami Sea Aquarium. We sponsored 26 kids for Christmas, uh, 24 kids, uh, 24 people in a family for Thanksgiving dinner. You need to incorporate something when it comes to charitable involvement. It may not be money, it may be time, you can volunteer, but I guarantee if you take some of these things that I'm talking about, it will take your business to the next level. There's a reason we have the success that we do, and it's because of the things that we do consistently. We're consistently involved with networking. We're consistently involved with charity. That's what we do. I authored a few books. The one on the bottom right is going to hopefully come out soon, uh, but the top, those three sold was the one I wrote with Ron Legrand. How many of you know Ron Legrand? Only a few of you. Ron Legrand was like the master. He's like the king of real estate. He's up in uh, the, the North Florida area, and I wrote this book with him. It did become a bestseller. And the reason I share that is because what that means for us and our business is that we just know what we're talking about. We didn't write a book to make money. We wrote a book to educate the people that we do business with, that we know what we're talking about. So when you leave here today, you have some tips that you can actually say, you know what? I learned something today, whether it's how to hide your name from public record, how it's to avoid navigating the inspection clause in, in a contract. So there's a lot that we're going to cover, uh, and, and hopefully you're going to learn something. And then you can download these books all on the website. If you go to our website, you can download them. They're on there. So I founded this company many years ago. Uh, 2001, I moved here. I started doing mortgages. I was doing real estate, and then I started doing title because I realized when I was at a meeting today, and that's what sparked it, someone said to me, you know, realtors, they're really great at filling in a contract. Because the real estate contract here in Florida is fill in the blank. 
It doesn't really take much to fill out a contract. But what it does take much to do is understand the contract, understand how to navigate through the contract. And that's one of the things that my experience from being in real estate, being in mortgages, being an investor, being a lender, taught me throughout the years that I can understand all of the mistakes I've made, all of the mistakes I've seen other people made to help you avoid them and get what in the end? The check. So I'm what's called a licensed title agent. It means I have my license to sign title insurance policies. We issue title insurance based on a national underwriter. So the analogy I like to use is similar to Allstate. You have an Allstate agent, they write insurance through Allstate, not through themselves. And that's the same thing we do. We write through two national underwriters. I'm not an attorney, as I told you. Uh, I did write a book, and it's really cool if you want to read it. Uh, land trusts are one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit later, and that's very important. Lex said, if you want to deal with a title company, you need to know someone who is land trust friendly. Okay? They need to understand how to navigate land trusts. And one of the stories I like to tell is when I sold all of my rental properties that I bought at the bottom of the market, I bought them all a certain way, but when I sold them, I was smart enough to make sure they were all in land trusts. And I'll never forget the conversation of this one investor-friendly title company in Miami, when we're getting ready to do the closing, they said, send me the wiring information for the trust. And that's when I got a little chuckle. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense because trusts are not a legal entity. You can't pay them. And they said, well, no, we have to pay them. I said, guess what? You're dealing with the wrong person because I'm gonna show you why. And I was able to prove my case to them, but title company after title company after title company, there are many investors that come to me and say, what do I do with this check payable to the trust? Because the title company gave them a check payable to it. There's nothing, you rip it up and throw it in the garbage. There's nothing you can do. So you need to understand how do land trusts work? How do you navigate a closing using a land trust? How do you make sure you get paid in your company, not in your trust? These are very important tips that we're gonna talk about a little bit later on. And I've closed over 5,000 deals. I did the count last week. We've closed over 5,000 deals in the history. Years ago, it was very, very slow. We went back, there were months we were doing three deals a month. There were months back when Lex was my only deal. And now you fast forward and we're closing on average about 95 to 100 transactions uh, on any given month. So we basically see it all. We're now ranked number five. So when Lex said we're one of the largest, we're ranked number five with our national underwriter in the entire state of Florida. That's pretty big for a small business like ours to be ranked. That just means that we do a lot of closings and being five star rated and being number five doesn't just have to do with the amount of closings that we're doing. It has to do with our audits that we go through every month. Our audits are crystal clean. They've never found one thing in any of our audits monthly. It's very, very important for a title company that's not behind in their audits, and we'll talk about that when we get to the insurance section. That's the staff. Many of you have dealt with most of the people there, um, but that's my, our most recent cruise we were on uh, a couple of months ago. They get a bonus incentive, and we take them on a cruise every single year if they hit that incentive, and that was one of the pictures, but that's the whole crew. And we have Victor. Where's Victor? Victor's in the back of the room, so you can all meet him after. Give him your card. He's one of our investor experts as well. Our closing cost calculator, you can download. Uh, you can go to our website. It's a mobile-friendly website. It's Title Rates. Our website's Title Rate. You can get it from that or just go to titlerates.com and that'll give you the calculator. The important part about this, and when we talk about closing costs, you'll, you'll know a little bit more why, but most investors and realtors are doing business when? When are you doing your business? After hours? On weekends? My office is closed. We're there 9 to 5. So what happens is if you need to know closing costs at 8 p.m. because you worked your 9 to 5 job, now you have a way to get those costs. And all you have to do is generate a quote and it'll give you all of the costs that you need to know. Very, very important. So let's talk about what is title insurance? So title insurance is a policy that protects a unique way. How many times do you buy title insurance when you buy a house? How many times do you buy homeowner's insurance when you buy a house? Car insurance? Health insurance? You see the difference? Title insurance, you buy it one time. Why? Because we're protecting in reverse. So we're guaranteeing when we do our search, we're giving you an insurance policy to protect everything in the past. 
We don't care what you do with your property once you buy it. We're here to protect everything in reverse. So we check liens, judgments, and which we'll talk about. We cover everything in reverse so we can see the risk that we're writing. We can run a title search and a lien search and say, you know what, this is our exposure. These are the things that we see, we're willing to insure it. And you only pay for it one time because it protects backwards and we can see everything that we're uh, covering. An important part is it does not cover permits. Write that down. Very, very, very important. The bank's title company, when you're doing a closing with the bank, they may not even pull a permit search unless you request them to and you think you're getting coverage. Permits are not covered in title insurance. Code violations are not covered. So if you have a code violation accruing a daily fine, guess what? It's not covered if it's missed by the title company. You're on the hook for it. And we talk about chapter 159 coverage. We'll talk more about this, but you can write that down and I'll get back to it. I have a whole slide on it. It's very, very important. We protect owners and lenders. So if we're doing a purchase with a loan, we give a policy to the owner as you the buyer, and we'll also give one to the lender. Do we have any lenders in the room? I know we have Jason here. He's with a company called Firefighter Mortgages. So pretty cool, you can make sure you talk to him after. Um, we found them actually on Facebook. They work very specifically with firefighters giving certain discounts. So if you know firefighters, and first responders, that's a good place to go for, uh, for a loan. They do regular loans as well, um, but that's how we connected because of our connection being a firefighter. And we'll talk about Schedule A. These are the parts of the title commitment. Schedule A, Schedule B1, and Schedule B2. And this is, again, going to be very important when you don't have the opportunity to choose a company like ours. The last presentation I did a couple of weeks ago at one of the clubs, the person said, you know what, using your company was seamless because I got all the documentation and I knew what was going on. And after I explained everything that should have been done, she realized that it just wasn't at the other title company. So it's very important. And it doesn't cover many items which we spoke about and we'll cover a little bit more. So title insurance questions. The biggest question I always get is, are prices regulated? How many of you think they're regulated by a show of hands? And the rest of you, how many of you think it's not regulated? And the rest of you just don't care. <laughs> so title insurance is regulated in the state of Florida. So if you come to me or you go to the other title company, the price should be what? Same. The same. If it's different, what does that mean? Someone's overcharging you. So by using our calculator, you know exactly what title insurance should cost. Title insurance does not change. There's one price, it's a calculation, and it does not change. What covered, what's that? I was going to ask you about the other fees that you'll see. We'll talk about the fees when we get to the closing statement. What coverages do I need? Well, for sure you need an owner's title insurance policy. Never buy a house without title insurance. You only pay for it once. It's not worth the shortcut. And I'll talk to you why in a little bit. Who usually pays for title? Buyer sometimes, seller sometimes, sometimes you're forced to use the bank's title company and you still have to pay for it. So it varies. It's what's negotiated in the what? Contract, contract right? Some of your contracts say buyer, some contracts say seller. You need to know what your contract says and that's who gets to select the title company. This is one of the big ones we see is, is the seller pushing a certain title company or is the realtor pushing or the mortgage company pushing a certain title company. And that's always when I tell people, run, unless you can do your own homework. Because if they're pushing a certain company, what's usually the reason? Kickbacks. Could be a kickback, could be. Usually it's not because they're giving the best possible service at the best possible rate. Usually not. So it's very important to understand who is choosing the title company. Make sure you have someone that represents you. Who do you trust in this business? No one. no one. You don't trust anyone in this business unless you've done business with them. There's a reason Lex comes to me with all of his students, because he knows when he funds a deal, if the deal goes south, the money's with me. The money's not with some other title company that he may have to fight to get it back or if he funds a deal for his student and then all of a sudden they wire the money back to the student 
and not him. Imagine that risk. So that's why these investors that are funding deals are using, like Equity Max, they use companies like mine because they know they can trust us. They know that we're holding their money and we're going to do right by the deal. But there's a lot of shady people. Florida is a sunny, pick, sunny place for shady characters. And it's scary. How much reassurance do you need doing a closing? Ooh. You should look up reviews on them, right? Make sure that they have reviews. How many reviews do they have? The first thing I always do when I look up a company is I go to Google and I say, do they have any reviews? If they have no reviews on Google or on Facebook, they're probably not reputable because everyone reviews something on Google or Facebook. So you need to check. Make sure these companies you're doing business with have a website and they're actually doing business. It's very important. All right, so insurance protection. These are some of the insurance policies. So I give you what kind of policy? You're buying, what type of title policy are you buying? Owners, right? You're buying an owners. We talk about owners and lenders. So if you're a buyer, you're getting an owner's policy. But what insurance do I carry to protect you for a mistake? How many of you have ever checked with your title company and asked to see a copy of their E&O insurance? Write it down. I look at the, the claims with the state of Florida every month I get from the Department of Insurance for fines for companies. And one of the number one things I see is failure to maintain insurance. Why? because it's expensive. Insurance is not cheap. So the first thing they cut is they couldn't make the premium. They say, oh, let me just wait. Maybe I'll get it next month. Hopefully I'll have some extra closings, right? I've been there where we've had three closings in a month and I say, well, how am I gonna make payroll? And instead of doing what some companies do, we just wrote cash advance against our credit card. We, we did what we needed to do to survive. But we never dipped into the escrow funds, which is what a lot of companies will do. Let me just write the check and then I'll pay it back next month. And then next month is worse off than the month before. And that's how the spiral effect, that's how the, that spiral effect happens that's landing people in jail. So we carry what's called E&O insurance, errors and omissions insurance. I'm going to tell you that most of your claims you're gonna have with a title company is not even gonna hit their E&O insurance because their deductibles are typically so high. So you're gonna to go to a title company, you're gonna tell them what problem you're having, and what are they gonna tell you? We can't take care of it. We can't pay it, just you take care of it, you know, file a claim if you want. And then you're gonna file a claim against their E&O insurance and it'll take forever. You'll file a claim against the title insurance policy and it'll take forever. So by learning some of the tricks that we're going to teach you today, some of the questions to ask, some of the documents to review, you're now going to learn how to avoid that. Because when you call the title company with a claim, they will be the last ones to write the what? Check. We have ones that for utility bills, for, for old owners, and then we have to go back to a title company and say, oh, you missed this, you didn't collect for it. And they say, I'm sorry, just pay it. And we say, what are you talking about? You're responsible to make sure. They say, well, there was no coverage for it, so we don't have to pay it. How about you just pay it because it's the right thing to do? And that's the problem when you're dealing with title companies that are not able to own the mistakes. It's very, very important. We're the first ones to cut the check. If we made a mistake, we'll cut the check. And we make sure that our client is covered because that's what's most important to us. So fidelity bond and a surety bond are two bonds that we cover. General liability insurance for our office. Workers' compensation, building and equipment coverage. Building and equipment coverage is an important one in today's market, why? Because all of your data is stored on their what? Equipment, right? So they should really have a policy that covers all of the equipment in their office. It's very important. And the last one, which I spend the most time on, is cyber liability protection. If your title company does not send you E&O insurance and cyber liability, it's a separate policy, run the other way. What is cyber liability? How many of you received an email today that was fraud? Few of you? I get emails every day that say, oh, closing documents are attached, click this link. And then you open the link, 
It takes you to a website. You try and sign in with your username and password thinking it's your email. Now they've captured all of your data. And now they send that to a buyer and say, buyer, please wire the money here. But it's not really the title company. So what insurance does the title company carry for that to make sure that your money is protected when you wire it out against email fraud? Okay? Everyone clear? That's one of the largest claims we're seeing now. And the problem is most companies do not have coverage for it. Because it's, again, very expensive to have cyber liability coverage, but it's something that you need to make sure you have. Because one hacked email can take your entire business down. We have a certain security measures in place, but what if it's the realtor that gets hacked? And then the realtor sends the, the buyer fake wiring instructions because that's what they thought we sent them and it wasn't true. It causes a big, big problem and we want to make sure money is not lost. Escrow disputes, another big one. We just settled an escrow dispute uh, yesterday for a client we were going back and forth and it was simply because the buyer came to the closing table and decided not to close. And he said, well, I want my money back. Well, it doesn't work that way. You signed a contract and we have to go through this process. So what I'm going to teach you here is how to avoid that because wholesaling is the process of buying a property and selling a property quick. And if you don't get out in time because you couldn't find a buyer, your deposit could be at risk. And that's the business of wholesaling. I'm going to keep the deposit back in your, your pocket. So the first thing is to learn how do you count days in the contract? Does anyone know? Business days or calendar days? Calendar days? Business days? How many of you don't know? Right? Every contract's different. Read your contract. You need to know. Is it business days or is it calendar days? If it's calendar days, it's one thing. If it's business days, are there holidays involved? You need to have a clear timeline as to when all of your contingencies are coming in. So the first one is the inspection period. That's the wholesaler's number one way out. You get a property under contract, you send it to Lex to find a buyer, and Lex's first question is going to be what to you? When's your inspection period expire? Because what does he need to do? He needs to find you a buyer to put up a deposit and get their inspection period cleared before yours is up so you don't lose your deposit, right? So he's looking out for your deposit. So the first thing you need to know, well, the second thing is inspection period. When does my inspection period expire? Is it three days, five days, 15 days, maybe no inspection period? Some contracts have no inspection period. You buy it as is, do your homework before. Code and permit check is another important one. The contract, the as is contract that was drafted, I think the, the most recent was 2014, I think, version. There's a new one coming out this month. Calls for permit checks to be done within your inspection period. Most people do not know that. Most people don't understand that that needs to be done. What are the chances that we can get a permit check and a code check within our 10 or 15 day inspection period? Well, let's ask the expert, Al. What are the chances we can get that done? It's possible, but not guaranteed. Possible, but not guaranteed. I'll go more on the not guaranteed, because we order a lot of them. So Al works for our uh, lean search company. Lean searches sometimes can take three weeks up in Riviera Beach to come in. So the problem is, is if you have a 15-day inspection period, and your permit, and you discover a permit on day 20, what do you do? Most people go to the seller and say, seller, can you fix this permit? The smart sellers are now turning around and saying, no, you needed to check that within your inspection period. You can't raise the issue now. So you need to make sure that either the permit search and lien search is back or it's excluded, which we'll talk about. As is contracts, know which contract you're using. People come to me and say, can I use that one page contract that you know, I, I saw at this get, get Rich Quick seminar? And I say, you can, but there's a reason that the most successful wholesalers and rehabbers 
in town are just using the standard far bar as is contract. There is a reason that they're doing it. Someone like Jimmy the wholesaler, if he's wholesaling a large amount of deals on a, on a yearly basis, why does he use that contract? But meanwhile, the one that took that get rich quick seminar wants to use the one page contract. So know what you're doing in your business, know what contracts you're using, it's very, very important. Financing contingency is important. We're gonna talk about that on another slide because there's a big change with, uh, when it comes to financing. And everything must be in what? There's no handshakes, folks. Everything should be in writing, not in text message, either email form, make sure documents are signed. It's very important. If you have a contract that's missing a signature or missing an initial, you're leaving yourself room for maybe a buyer or a seller to back out of a deal. Take your business seriously. That's why I started earlier and I said that a lot of the realtors, they just fill in the blanks in the contract, but they don't actually understand the components of the contract. And the more you understand the contract, the better chance you have to have an ironclad deal, to not leave room for someone to get out of a deal for some nonsense reason. Like this one we just settled, the seller wound up agreeing to forfeit 12,000, I mean the buyer agreed to forfeit $12,000 of their $15,000 deposit. It's important, it's very, very important. And if that wholesaler didn't have an ironclad contract, there may have been room to, to get out because it was a sophisticated buyer. Buyer came in and said, well, no, let's send it to mediation. You can't release it. We had to go back and say, your contract doesn't call for a mediation clause, so it's fine. If you'd like, we'll go to mediation, but if you don't agree, you're gonna be sued for the deposit and you're gonna be sued for specific performance, which means you must close on the deal. You came to the closing table and just decided you didn't wanna close for whatever reason. It's okay. You just forfeit your deposit. And he finally agreed. Yes? With, with all the internet frauds um, and cyber fraud that's happening, how do you feel about electronic signatures? Electronic signatures are fine. You can use like DocuSign, one of those companies. What I always say is use an email that has a double authentication. That's one of the important things. If you were here on one of these computers and tried to log into my email, it would send me a text message and say, put in this code. It's called double authentication, which means that you can't access my email unless you're on my office computer sitting at my desk or on my cell phone without this code. Very important, and Google has that if you, if you use Google. Um, when we talk about other parts of the presentation, I'll basically explain it. The, the reality is, is they just don't know. They're just not used to it. You know, we get questions all the time from the bank and we have to go back and prove them wrong. Like I talked about with the trust and stuff. It's just because they're not used to it. They're not used to seeing electronic signatures, so they're just not okay with it. That's the reality. Loan approval. So this is the big change in the contract. When you have a buyer and they're getting a loan and they have 30 days to provide the loan commitment, what happens on day 31? It extends. The way the contract reads now is it automatically just extends until the seller comes and says, hey, buyer, provide me your loan approval or I'm canceling the contract. It'll just go day 31, 32, 33. And then if on day 45, the buyer gets denied financing, they come back to you as the seller, say, I got denied financing, and your response is what? You'll, you had 30 days. I'm taking your deposit for failure to close. And the answer to you as the seller is no, you're not, because it automatically extends. It doesn't just automatically get waived. But what does this say in bold letters here? The new contract, which comes out this month, April, deems waived after the inspection period is expired. I mean, the, the loan contingency is expired. They're changing loan commitment to loan approval. So if the buyer has 30 days to provide a loan approval, what happens on day 31? Loan contingency goes out the door. It's now a cash contract. Big, big, big change. How many realtors do I have in the room? This is the, one of the biggest changes you need to realize with this new contract that comes out this month. If you're representing a buyer and they're getting a loan, make sure you either extend it before the expiration or cancel the contract. 
because you're going to put your buyer's deposit at risk. And then what happens when your buyer's deposit's at risk? If your buyer loses their deposit because you failed to cancel the contract in enough time, who are they suing? They're suing you. It'll cost you more to defend the lawsuit than it will to probably pay them their deposit back. Scary, but you need to know that. It's very, very, very important. All right, lean search matters is an important one that I talk, told you I'd cover. This is text, and if you email Victor, if you take Victor's card or give him one of your cards, we can email you this language. This is the language that was drafted in order to keep permit issues, code violation issues, homeowners association violations out of the what? The inspection period. Remember we said the inspection period, you have to do your permit check before the expiration of your inspection period. This is the clause that if you add this to your contract, it says that if the buyer discovers at any time any of these issues, seller shall remedy these matters at seller's cost and expense prior to closing. So that basically says is, hey seller, I'm going to do an inspection of the property and as long as everything's good, I'm going to close. But if I find a permit, if I find a code issue, if I find an HOA violation, even though it's as is, you need to remedy your problems. Make sense? So did you say you add that to the contract? You add that, yeah, to the additional terms of your contract, you would add this. And I'm seeing this more and more. There was one attorney that drafted this that we see in a lot of contracts. So that's what people are putting in. And that's going to keep those permit issues out of the inspection period. Because the reality is the search will not be back in 15 days. If we order it on day one, maybe. But lien searches typically aren't ordered right away. They're ordered once we get into the deal a little bit. So different types of searches. This is a weird one that, that I like to talk about a little bit to write down. Lean search are not actually liens, believe it or not. So a lean search, which is weird, I don't know why they call it a lean search. Well, the whole harmless is typically going to be at closing. This is to get you before the closing. So if you discover a permit issue, an expired permit because they opened for a new roof and never had it inspected, do you want to be responsible to hire an engineer to go close a permit? I don't want to. So that's why that's important. And remember what I said, permits are not what? They're not covered in title. So you can't go to the title company and, and it's not their problem. They're going to tell you permits aren't covered in title. So it's important. So lien searches are actually not liens. These are just things that they search. These are going to be permits. Permits aren't liens. Make sure your title company is searching what kind of permits? Open. 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 Closed permits. Expired. And expired permits. Expired is the big one. Expired permits will come back and bite you. They will be for work that was done. They pulled the permit, never got it inspected. It could be roofing. So you have to now hire an engineer to go and draft an engineer's letter to guarantee to the city that it was done to code. Very, very costly. So make sure your title company is ordering a lien search that includes open permits, closed permits, and expired permits. Do I have any requirement to order a lien search as a title company? Scary. Very, very scary. There are attorneys that represent sellers in Palm Beach County, let's say, they'll do a closing and they don't even order a lien search. Because they say, why would I order a search that could possibly raise issues for my client? Who are they really representing? <coughs> Pretty sad, because we're supposed to be an independent third party. That's where the line gets drawn between the attorney and the title company and the ones that own both because it, there's a line there that they have to cross. Because are you the title company acting as an independent third party or are you an attorney representing the client that hired you? It's a big, big difference. And it's unique to find the ones that know how to navigate the two. But when I saw that, and I saw that this attorney was doing that, I said, I can't believe you do something like that. Fast forward, I have another title company, very investor friendly here locally. 
They made one of our clients sign a document that said, buyer, we've ordered a lien search as a courtesy to you, but we're not giving you any coverage for it. Does that sink in with any of you? We've ordered a lien search. Oh, it's, it's almost like saying, I've bought you car insurance, but if you get into an accident, I won't fix your car. Okay? It's pretty scary. So you mean I ordered a lien search, I paid for a lien, lien search, but you're not giving me coverage. That's pretty scary. So lien searches, that covers permits, it covers code, it covers utility bills. What's the largest utility bill you've seen on a property? For water, let's say water and sewer. 5,000? I've seen up to 14,000. The city of Deerfield Beach, $14,000. We mitigated it down to $3,000. Title search. Title search is actually searching for liens. Weird, huh? They should just switch them. They should call a title search a title search. They should switch them, right? And call a lien search a title search. Title searches are checking everything that you could check in public records. So what are some of the things we're looking for? Mortgages, judgments, bankruptcies, divorces, HOA liens, foreclosures, money judgments. That's everything that's recorded and tied to usually either the owner's name or the legal description of the property. Tax search verifies the property taxes. So that's gonna check to make sure property taxes are paid. One of the unique things that you need to realize, well, how many of you have gone to the tax collector site to pull a search? Okay, one of the things you need to search for is back taxes. We see a big mistake for companies that look and see that the last year was paid, but didn't realize there was a certificate from two years back. And my famous story was Palm Beach County told us taxes, the website said taxes were due on a property, so we called them and said, can we get a payoff? And they said, we're sorry, our website's wrong. Taxes are actually have been paid on this property. We said, okay, can you just send us a letter that says taxes are paid? Makes sense, right? So I have it because there was a discrepancy. So we got the letter, put it in the file. Two years later, my client calls me and says, hey, by the way, my, my property's going to tax deed sale. So what are you talking about? Those taxes were paid. We called the county, the tax collector site, and they said, I'm sorry, our letter was wrong. Taxes are actually due. Cut us a check for $6,000 or your property's being sold. And I spoke to the news, that's when we were on one of the NBC stories we were on. And they basically said, hey, sue us. But I work for the county and I'm on salary and you have to hire an attorney on retainer. So unless you can find an attorney to work this case for free, it's gonna cost you more to defend it than it will to just pay the seven, six, I think it was $5,700 in taxes. That happened twice already with the tax collector. So it's scary, so you need to make sure you have that coverage. And then OFAC name search, how many money launderers do we have in the room? Okay, a few of you raised your hand. Money laundering is a big one that we search for. That's one of the number one delays at funding is when we search a name and, and something gets triggered. It could be we just need more information, maybe a middle name, a date of birth, something like that, just because you may have a common name on a money laundering or some terrorist watch list or something. Um, but we check it. We check to make sure that uh, the people we're doing business with are actually good. All right, title insurance policy. So we issue, prior to closing, what's called a title commitment. How many of you have ever read a title commitment? One, two, three. So three of you in this room. How many of you have closed on a, on a piece of real estate before, even a house you live in? A lot more. So that's telling you something, right? Your title commitment is like leaving the auto insurance company with a binder. They give you a temporary card, the title commitment is your temporary insurance card to let you know that I'm gonna cover you. And I had an investor came to me, it was with a, a title company, I think it was Red Door Title they were called. They did a first and second mortgage. The title company just never paid off the second mortgage. And they came to me saying, what do I do? I said, well, where's your title commitment? Because he didn't even know who it underwrote through. He just knew the title company's name but couldn't get a hold of them. So by having the binder, we would have said, oh, you underwrote through First American or through Old Republic. Let's go to them 
and file a claim and they'll represent you instantly. So that's the important part where you can see your title commitment to know if the title company goes out of business, who do I go to to file a claim? Very, very, very important. We talked about owners and lenders. Reissue rates are a big one. If you've bought a property, and this is good for you if you're, if you're wholesaling or if you're buy, buy, fix, and sell. If you purchased a policy within the last three years, you get what's called a reissue credit. And title companies will not give it to you, and they will not ask to give it to you unless you ask them. Imagine that. So why not, if you can get a significant discount on your insurance policy, why do they not give it to you? Why do you think? Huh? They lose money. Right? They lose money. If your insurance policy is lower, that means they've made less what? Commission. So knowing that if you're buying, fixing, and selling, take your title insurance policy, send it to the title company and say, please give me a reissue credit on the title policy. And now you'll get a discount on your title insurance. Wholesaling is the only caveat. We can't do it unless we're doing both closings. Which is why people like Lex will send us both closings because I can give you, I only charge one closing fee for both deals and I, only ch and I give you a reissue credit on the policy. So it's cheaper than if you take closing A somewhere else and then come to me for closing B. It's cheaper to just come to me for all of it. You said it was three years, right? Three years, yeah. Three years from the effective date of the title policy. And then you leave your title company with what's called a marked up title commitment. Write that down. When you leave a closing, ask for a marked up title commitment. That's basically where the title company will cross off. See at the bottom there, marked up. They will basically go through and cross off. This has been complied with. This has been complied with. We're deleting this. So when you get your final policy, all of those issues cannot be on there. And we'll talk about what we cover it. So a title commitment covers who and what is Schedule A? Who's buying, who's selling, and the legal description of the property. Do you think you should make sure it's right? What happens if you buy a property and your name was spelled wrong? You get out of it. You're going to have a problem. You may have a problem selling it. That's the important part. You may have a problem selling it. So check the title commitment. Make sure your name is spelled right. Very, very important. Uh, B1 are what's called requirements. This says, I will, as a title company, comply with all of these items in order to give you clear and marketable title. So what should we do on a marked up title commitment with everything on Schedule B1? We cross it off, right? So when you get your marked up commitment, it should be everything on Schedule B1 should be crossed off. What do the sneaky ones do? They move B1 issues to B2, which means that it's what? An exception, which means you have no what? That's the little trick that some of these title companies, when they raise title defects, they just take the defect, they move it to B2, you close because you never looked at the what? Your title commitment, you didn't know, and now you closed with that underlying issue. That's how scary this business is, folks. Because that's what they do. Reforeclosures, judgments, code enforcement liens. They just move them to Schedule B2. And now you have no coverage. So when that code enforcement issue comes back later, the title company is going to tell you you have no coverage. So look at the title commitment. That's going to be your checklist to make sure everything that's being taken care of. You signed. I mean, that's if you caught it before and they say that, listen, this is an issue and we're just not going to cover it, then you have a choice to make. The problem I have are the ones that are not given choices. If you're given a choice to close or not close, that's different. We will move things to Schedule B2, but the clients will know. They'll sign a hold harmless specific to that and they'll explain the risks. Real quick, that's what a survey looks like. Most investors don't order a survey. 
I'll tell you, in all the years, I've seen one survey issue where a house was a double lot. It was a house in a pool. I think it was Victor's closing, right? Well, I'm doing the pool closing tomorrow. Oh, he's doing the pool closing Thursday. Back to the owner. The person that bought it. All right, so here's a good, that's funny. So here's a good story. So the owner bought a property, lot A and lot B. You following me? Lot A was the house, lot B was the pool. He owned them both. He went into foreclosure. The bank foreclosed on lot A. Never foreclosed on lot B, which is the pool. So it went into foreclosure. The bank sold the house to our prospective buyer, and the bank sold him lot A, which is all they foreclosed on. Nobody pulled the survey to know that it was actually two separate lots. So all of a sudden, two years later, that closing was probably two or three years ago. Six years ago, oh, I'm sorry. Six years ago. So six years ago, the guy's first getting his pool back now because the owner came and said, you're swimming in my pool, pay me. Now what is the price he's getting for it? $17,000 for a swimming pool that the bank should have foreclosed on. Does it make sense to get a $300 survey? I don't know, that's up to you. But that's what a survey looks like. So imagine if your pool was just cut here. And then the old owner comes back and says, get out of my pool, you're swimming in it. Six years later, $17,000. All right, so let's talk about settlement charges. I know a few of you asked, what are some of the customary charges that we see? Well, the first one are realtor commissions. Realtors are good at what they do and they deserve a commission. But what do you need to make sure it's on there? That it's right. What do most realtors look at on a closing statement? their commissions, and then they send it to the client and say, oh, looks good. <laughs> right or wrong, that's what happens. So realtor commissions are important. Transaction charges are also important. All real estate companies, for the most part nowadays, charge a transaction fee, a coordination fee, a processing fee, whatever kind of fee you want to call it. They all charge it. If you didn't agree to it in the contract, you don't have to what? Pay it. Just look at your contract. If it's in your contract, you pay for it. If it's not in your contract, you don't have to pay for it. Lender charges are an important one. Know what your lenders are charging so there's no surprises. We hear stories all the time. Hard money lenders, all of a sudden, two points became three points. Three points became four points. Four points became inspection fee, and an appraisal fee, and an admin fee, and a doc prep fee. And all these fees get added in after. So know your fees up front to know what the charges need to be. Transactional funding is usually 1% to 2% of the deal. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Lean search and title search, again, if you look at a closing statement and you see a lean search or a title search payable to the title company, I'd ask to see the invoice. I'd ask to see the invoice. Because if I pay $75 for a title search, why would I charge you $150 for a title search? Processing fee, I guess, to maybe download and look at the search. To me, that's why I get title insurance. That's why I charge a closing fee. So look at your closing statements and see what are the title companies charging and ask to see the invoice. And then the next question is, if the invoice is lower than what they're charging you, is why are you charging me more? Our invoices are payable to our lien search company, to our title insurance underwriter that provide that service. We don't pad any of those fees. Owner's title insurance and lender's title insurance, where do you get that calculation? Because remember, it's a regulated rate. Where do you get it? Your phone, your, your mobile app, right? The title rates site will tell you how much it is. People call me all the time. And the first question is, what are closing costs on, on a deal? I'm buying a house. I say, I can't give you that. There's so many factors that have to do with who pays, what fees, what is the price, are you getting a loan? So I can't just tell you, there is no standard. Fees will range depending on the deal. Survey, we talked about REO title company charges. One of the big ones I see on this that, that we get waived a lot is when someone like Jim's buying or, or Lex, they're buying a wholesale deal. And on title company A, all of a sudden, they're charged an attorney fee on a closing. And then we look at it and say, did you hire an attorney? They say, no. 
So we have to go to the REO title company and say, hey, law firm, why are you charging the client, the buyer, an attorney fee? And what's their response? I don't know, it's just standard. Do you have a retainer agreement? Did he hire you? Because as far as I know, you can charge him a closing fee and title insurance and that's it. You can't charge a retainer fee if you're not representing them. But they try and get away with it. So know what the charges are standard. Settlement charges as well. Our charges are flat rate standard charges. Some title companies are charging triple what we charge. So you just need to know what's reasonable. Look at our mobile app, it'll tell you. A cash deal is uh, uh, 470, a financing deal is 770, a seller docs are 370. So it's just, you just, it's consistent. So you need to know what they are. And doc stamps, and this is an important one where I tell wholesalers uh, a, a scary story. As we had a wholesaler, I think Jim was funding the deal, came to us and said, uh, we're not making any money. I said, well, what are you talking about? He says, we have zero profit. And we tried to figure out why, and it was because the wholesaler agreed to pay the seller's fees on the buy. I mean, he, he agreed, yeah, he agreed to pay the seller's fees on the buy, and he agreed to pay the seller's fees again when he sold it. So he got double hit, because he paid seller, buyer, and then as the seller. So doc stamps are a big number. On a $100,000 deal, doc stamps are $700. So he had to pay 700 and 700. I think they were only making like 1500 split between two or three people. They had to just bring in money to get the deal off the table so they didn't lose their deposit. So you need to realize in your contracts, what am I paying for on the bank contract? And make sure it's what on the one you're selling. The same. If you're buying one way, sell it the same way. So if you're paying doc stamps on the buy, Make sure you're not paying them on the sell. Make sure your buyer is paying them. Very, very important before you get double hit on closing costs and, and lose money on the deal. Types of deeds. So we see a warranty deed. That's typical what you'll see when, a, when an owner lives in a property. Then you see what's called a special warranty deed. This is when you see a bank. People don't live in the property. It could be an investor or a bank. They sell via special warranty deed. One of the mistakes that we see is you're buying with a special warranty deed, but your contract doesn't call for you to deed out with a special warranty deed. So it's very important to know if you're buying a bank-owned property, throw a clause in there that the property will be conveyed via special warranty deed. You're going to buy it from the bank with a special warranty deed, and you're going to sell it with a special warranty deed. All's fine. They're both very, very good deeds. Trustees deed we're seeing less and less of now, and my famous one is the quick claim deed. How many of you have ever done a quick claim deed? Okay. Quick claim deeds are very, very, very scary, and that's where I told you I was going to talk to you about a little story. So here's a deed that came to us. Matthew sold the property to Jerry when? 07. Okay. Matthew was having a hard time. He just didn't want this property. He had a loan on it. And Jerry came to him and said, you know what, Matthew, I'll buy your property from you and I'll just continue paying your mortgage payments for you. Makes sense, right? It's a good deal. Plenty of people have done that in the past, you know, where, where they just assume the mortgage. Matthew said, what do I have to lose? It makes sense. I'll make a little bit of money. You'll pay my mortgage. Have a nice day. Well, guess what? Jerry's trying to sell the property. Okay? And there's an existing loan on it that Jerry's been paying for all these years. The problem is, is we don't know if Matthew was married or single at the time he sold the property. And he was living in it, which means if he was married, his what needed to sign? And nobody can get a hold of Matthew. So there's defect number one. Defect number two is, what does this say? Anyone read that? Abbreviate. What is an abbreviated legal description? Abbreviated legal description means that they went to the property appraiser site and just copy and pasted what was on the property appraiser site. It's not a valid legal to sell the property. So now what does Jerry have? A title claim. But guess what Jerry didn't buy? Title insurance. How many years later? Very, very, very important. Stay away from quick claim deeds. Was this an honest transaction? Absolutely. But because nobody handled it and they bought this document probably from Office Depot, it now caused the problem. Quick claim deeds are also scary. How many of you saw our NBC story with the guy 
that we uncovered the big fraud scheme. Steve saw it. So if you haven't seen it, just go to our website and check out. It's right on the homepage, our NBC story. The guy's still sitting in jail waiting to go to trial. It's been over a year from a home stealing scam that we uncovered. And a guy was trying to sell property. He was forging deeds, recording them. And then we finally did this big sting operation with, with the police in the room behind us and all staged outside and camera crew, news crew. They took the guy down. It's the most amazing thing I've ever done. Scared because the guy was a convicted felon. But just watch the story and it'll just show you what people are trying to get away with in today's real estate market. Yes. They can do a quick claim deed if it's done properly. Yeah, interfamily transfers, divorces, deeding property to kids, um, deeding property into a, a trust. You will see quick claim deeds. I'm not saying quick claim deeds are bad. They're bad when they're used for the bad reason. So usually interfamily is usually fine. But there's no reason you can't do a, a warranty deed. There's no difference. Cost the same. Doc stamps are doc stamps. If doc stamp, the problem is, is people would do quick claim deeds all those times. They would do ten dollars and seventy cents, pay the minimum doc stamps, not realizing doc stamps were actually due. They just chose not to pay it. The county will record anything, and now people are getting hit with all of these money judgments for failure to pay doc stamps. So, so if they all cost them, like, exactly. Just because that's what people have always said. Oh, just quick claim the property. Oh, just quick claim the property. They just assume it's less work. It's not any less work. One says quick claim deed, one says warranty deed. Quick claim deed is basically when someone is saying, I'm giving you this for whatever in exchange, and I'm just waiving all liability. I, you can never come back to me for anything. Would you want to receive that? That seems pretty scary to me. You just want to give it to me. I better do some research to make sure it's good. When you sell it, there's nothing you can do now if you already own it. But it would be smart to do a search and see what underlying issues may be there. You can have title insurance with a quick claim deed. Did they do it? Very rare are you going to see someone do that. They, they, would do a, they would have to do a thorough search and see why. Maybe it was a bank and there was a reason, an explanation that the bank was giving it. But normally, you're not going to find it. Maybe once, you know, if they did it. Have you seen it at all, Victor? No. So, I mean, there could be a reason that they did it, and then maybe it has to go to underwriting. Remember, we're underwriting risk. So there are things that three or four title companies may not do, and they bring it to us, and we do it. Because we go to our underwriter, we say, let's actually look at the risk. Like this one is a perfect example. We're trying to figure out what is the true risk from this guy from 07 that never came back. The risk is that he has heirs to his estate that says that was my property and it was fraudulently deeded over. That's the risk. So it's all risk based. So the seller, they do not represent you. Remember that. We talked about that, right? They close with what's called the hold harmless. Now when you're closing with the bank, they're going to give you what's called the hold harmless agreement. That's a blanket document that says you agree to close and if anything happens after closing, you're not covered. That's pretty scary, folks. Never sign a hold harmless agreement unless it's specific to something. We have them in our closings for surveys, for, for lien searches if the client decides not to order a lien search, for maybe code enforcement issues that the buyer knows they're getting. Never sign with a blanket hold harmless because you are opening yourself up for exposure. They do not disclose title defects. Title defects, they usually just move to where? Schedule B2. They move them and hope that you'll close. They don't order permit searches a lot of times, so you need to know to ask for what kind of permits? Open, expired, closed. Very important. They do not understand investors. We know that. If you go to a bank and tell them you're flipping a deal, what are they going to say? Not in my house. Right? They will not understand that you're flipping a deal. I just had another claim we were going through where an investor tried to come to me because the wholesaler passed off his end buyer's deposit as his deposit and he's claiming fraud on me that double closings are illegal. And I said, double closings are not illegal. If the wholesaler is buying it and funding it cash, there's no reason to disclose that they're reselling it. 
They're two totally separate independent contracts. I have the duty to disclose contract A with the facts of contract A and the facts of contract B. Unless they're trying to do funny business, it's not illegal. So if you hear flips are illegal, they're not. It's just how they're done. When you're using the end buyer's money, which there are some companies that'll do, to fund the first transaction, now you have a duty to disclose because now you're making two deals, what? One deal. That's why transactional funding is so important. They don't allow double closings and they don't have lower fees. So know what your fees are and know how to save yourself. You know, when we review deals for, for Lex and his students, sometimes we'll go to the front side and knock off three, four hundred dollars. Do that multiple times in a month, it saves you guys a lot of money. E-recording is something that we do. Um, we were one of the first ones in Florida doing it. That basically means we can take a document, you close today, we record today, and it fixes the seasoning that the FHA lenders are requiring sometimes. Where they're saying, oh, we want to see the person that owns the property for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. So by us recording, because the reality is, is the counties are 30 to 60 days behind with recording. If you were to send it to them via FedEx or courier. So sometimes it could take 30 to 60 days to get your deed recorded. We literally close today, record today. In Broward County, it's minutes. Palm Beach and Miami are a little delayed, maybe a day or two. But very, very important to make sure whoever's using uh, e-recording, the title company's doing it. Okay, so fraud is a big one that, that we talk about. So we see fraud a lot. Why, we can no longer accept checks for closings. We used to, how many of you used to close deals in the day where we would take a certified check? Some of you, no more. Certified checks are no good. They're not worth the paper they're written on unless it's given in advance of closing and then we can get it in the bank, verify it's cleared. Uh, we can't take it anymore. The deals need to be funded via wire transfer. And one of the important things here is make sure that you're conveying that message to your buyers. Because a lot of the international buyers, they're trying to avoid wire fees and they're sending a what? Well, they're sending an ACH, which is an electronic funds transfer. Okay? So you need to make sure that they're actually sending a wire because if that electronic funds transfer hits our account, what do we do? We deny it. Then it's going to take time to get back and it's just going to delay the closing. So make sure you're clear with your buyers because if you're wholesaling a deal, you may be in a short timeline and if all of a sudden that money comes in via electronic funds, you could lose your deposit on the front side. It's important, folks. Very, very important fact. Deeds must have witnesses and notaries. It's something you can look at. Um, that's what, some of the things that we check, but some of the common issues that we see. Homestead property, so if you know you're buying from a homeowner, so you, if you're in the habit not buying from the banks, you're doing short sales, or you're doing uh, regular seller work where you're dealing with sellers, just know that if it's homesteaded and they live in the property and they're married, their spouse has to join on the contract. Don't get to the closing table to find out, oh, my wife's not available. My wife's out of town, she's in another country. That was the story we got with the fraud guy, that the one was in Hawaii, he's in the military, on a, on a military base somewhere. So right away I smelled something and we tracked the guy down. But that's the story you're gonna hear. Spouse has to sign if they live in the property. My spouse is out of the country. Seller's proceeds, you hear remote deposits a lot, wiring instructions, just be careful when you're communicating via email wiring info, where to send your proceeds, because your profit can very easily be transferred somewhere else. It happens every single day. So just be careful who you're talking with at the title company. Maybe verify on the phone that you have the right wiring instructions. So you'd call our office, say, hey, Victor, can I just verify the wiring instructions you have? Many of our good clients and tons of students of Lexus, you guys are already stored in our system, so it makes it easy. Um, but if you're closing with these title companies, verify they have the right wiring instructions before they send the wire, because it could wind up going to somebody else. And Quicklin Deed Properties, we talked about in EFT. That was the story. That was Mr. Ferguson that, that came in. That was him right there. And uh, it's a pretty cool story. So just watch it. It's a three or four minute story on our website. All right, so double closings. We talked about it. They're never done where? At the bank, right? If you tell the bank you're doing a flip, what do they say? No way, folks. There's two sets of closing costs. What's the alternative to a flip? 
assignments, which we'll talk about. Two sets of closing costs on a double closing. It's just the reality, folks. Why would you do a double closing and have two sets of closing costs? What's the, the reason for you, the wholesaler? Confidentiality of your what? Your profit. How many of you want to go to a buyer and say, you know what, I'm making 15 grand. Here's the, here's the contract, right? That's why assignments are less common and double closings are more common because on a double closing you don't have to disclose your profit. Not that they won't see it in public record, but by then your closing's already done. So it just keeps your purchase price confidential. It's not none of their business how much money you're making. They're closed simultaneously, which means basically we're closing A and B the same exact time, one second apart. Even more of a reason why the title company needs to be investor friendly to make sure they can navigate that. Hard money lenders love it. Companies like uh, Equity Max, they love double closings. They will fund you on double closings. And then they love e-recording, which we talked about, right? It gets the mortgage and the deed recorded instantly. So very, very important. Another reason why you want to make sure you're dealing with someone that does that. And then assignment of contract. I think this one talks about it. So assignment of contract, we're seeing more of them now because the profits are a little bit less. The problem with double closings is the profit is higher, so that's why they do it. On an assignment deal, you may find a deal where the profit's only two or three thousand dollars, and an assignment makes sense for you to do, right? An assignment is basically where you buy a property, you agree to buy a property, and then you sell the rights to that contract to somebody else to step in and close. So you just make a fee. It could be three thousand, five thousand, whatever that fee is. As long as you don't have a problem disclosing the profit, an assignment's going to be much better. It's one set of closing costs. One title policy, one set of doc stamps, one set of fees. So it puts more what in your pocket? If you can get away with it, an assignment's great. You just need to find a title company that can handle assignments and handle it properly because you have to be very careful with them. Because could you imagine we're sitting at a closing table and the title company is just rubbing that assignment fee in that buyer's face? How does that look for you? I'm not saying you hide it, but you have to do it. You have to be careful. You have to be tender with these types of transactions to make sure the deal closes. So sometimes you can and sometimes you cannot be released from an assignment. Just look at your contract. Do I have the right to assign it? And if so, do I get released from liability? Which means once you assign it, if that buyer doesn't close, you have what kind of liability? None. Most sellers aren't going to release you, but hey, if you can get an assignment done and get released from liability, that's the best for you. Assignment fee is disclosed on the HUD. If you have a title company that, will, that says, oh, we don't have to disclose the assignment on the HUD, run the other way. Because it should be disclosed on the HUD and the buyer should be getting title insurance coverage to cover that fee. So their purchase price would be a little bit higher. They can buy that extra coverage with approval. That's where we'll go to our underwriter and say, hey, this buyer's buying it. They want title insurance coverage to cover the exposure of their assignment fee. And they look at it and say, okay. And it's the art of the closing. That's how it's handled. It has to be very careful. Transactional funding. How many of you have closed with transactional funding before? So a couple of you, mostly Lex's students. Uh, I know Lex provides the funding for, for his students. It's used when flipping a deal. That basically means that you don't need credit, you don't need income. All you need is maybe a $500 or $1,000 deposit. Find a good house, get it under contract and bring it to Lex. Lex will then turn around and find a buyer for you. Lex will put up all the money to close on the deal for you and you split the profit. How many of you think that sounds like a fair deal? You find the deal, he finds the buyer, he puts up the money, he has all the risk, and you get 50% of the profit. Great deal. That's where transactional funding is, where Lex will fund your deal for you. Very, very good, and it's used on deals daily. It's the last piece of the puzzle. Cost for funding, as I said, they could range anywhere up to 2%, depending on the size of the deal. If one title company's handling both, sometimes we can get uh, a little bit of a better deal. Because Lex will say, well, where am I sending my, mo my money? And he says, oh, we're sending it to ABC Title Company. He says, well, that's pretty risky. 
because I could wind up owning a property or having a, you know, a mortgage money out there. But if Kevin's doing both closings, maybe we'll save you a little money on the funding because now he knows that money's coming in my account and the money's going out of my account back to him. So it's a little bit less risky for him knowing it's coming to me than going to some title company he's never heard of. It's called flash funding also. It's when, using, when you're closing a deal that could be the same title company, but usually two different title companies. So if you're buying from the bank or you're buying from uh, two separate title companies, that's when it's used. Can I use my end buyer's money? Well, we talked about that, right? You can, but you know the risks associated with it. And again, it needs to be approved, cash deal, title companies handling both, disclosure signed by all parties. You might as well just do an assignment at that point if you're disclosing that you're flipping so it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't require a mortgage and a note. So Lex is not gonna make you sign a note, a mortgage, check your credit, check your income, or any of that. So how many of you would love to get into a deal for $1,000? Right, it makes sense. That's why his students are in the room and, and there's many successful ones of people that can go to one of his boot camps, come out, find a deal, flip it. And then you do three or four of those and then all of a sudden, you bought your first rehab. And now you're not making the small amount of money, you're making the large amount of money. And it happens like this. If you're committed to being here every single month following the plan, you can do it as well. All right, code violations. So utility bills can become liens. We talked about $14,000, I've seen liens. They're covered in title insurance when they become what? A lien. When they're just an open utility bill, it's not covered in title insurance. So if the title company misses a utility bill, good luck getting them to cover it later on. You'll probably have to just eat the expense. Permits are not covered in title insurance we talked about. Code enforcement liens accrue, uh, violations accrue a daily fine. So sometimes it could be $150, $250, $300 a day. I think Rob, you had one recently, right? Didn't you have one that was a large fee? And you mitigated it, you went down and what was, do you know what it was to begin with? $900,000 in daily fines. And what did you pay in the end? $800. Yeah, $800. So a $900,000 $900, lien became $800. What's He's a closing rock star, this guy. He came to me years ago and said, I'm he's, he was a realtor, and he says, I'm tired of helping all these investors become successful. I said, I'll help you out. Find a deal. We arranged his money for him. He bought his first deal, and now he's doing them monthly. He's knocking them out. Good job. So that's how it happens, folks. Just be a, hang around the right people, and they'll help you become more successful. Anyone can do it. You don't need that much money to get into a deal. Someone will usually, if it's a good enough deal, someone will put up the money for you. So code liens can be mitigated. And then I always say, pull a lien search, folks. If they're not pulling lien searches, you need to make sure they are. Make sure the bank's pulling a lien search. Don't let them tell you it's not covered. Pull a lien search, find out, because that stuff is not covered. And on the title insurance policy, how many of you have a title insurance policy that you would be able to look at? So write this down this chapter 159 coverage and look at your exceptions and see if that's listed as an exception. Because only attorneys will ask to have it removed for their clients. I remove it if there's a lien search on every policy. If you've had a policy with me and got a lien search, that's removed. But if it reads chapter 159 coverage as your exceptions, guess what you don't have? Lien search coverage. You don't have coverage and that's what they do, folks. They order a lien search, they put it as an exception to the policy. When the issues come up, they say it was an exception to the policy. And the problem is, is you can't then go to the underwriter to have it removed. Because they're gonna say it's not covered in title insurance. So now you have to hope the title company will own that mistake. And most likely they won't. Judgments. A lot of wholesalers think, well, I have a judgment, I can't buy and sell property. I'll never forget, Lex had a student that put a property under contract and, and basically the day before closing we realized I think she had a judgment in her name. Couldn't get any money on the deal. This is why land trusts are so important. But judgments, money judgments attach. And if you have money judgments, you can talk to someone like Lex that can help you navigate how you can still buy property even if you have bad credit and judgments in your name. It is still possible to buy and sell real estate as a wholesaler 
even if you have these on there. They attach to any property you own except for the house you live in. Homestead is exempt. How many of you, who knows the famous case for uh, the homestead law in Florida? Anyone? O.J. Simpson. You remember O.J.? So O.J. had a multi, multi million dollar house and nobody can touch it because it was his homestead. So your homestead nobody can touch. But other than that, someone can get it. Now the IRS can touch your homestead and your mortgage company and your homeowners association can go after you for failure to pay. But if you pay your taxes and you pay your mortgage, nobody can touch the house that you live in. Land trusts do help you avoid judgment. So that's why Lex is a, a big advocate for land trusts because let's just face it, folks, people will come to Lex and say, I'm putting my last thousand dollars on my credit card. I'm coming to your boot camp and I want to wholesale deals. And most likely they had some type of bad credit. So he'll teach you how you can use a land trust and avoid having to pay money judgments because then there's no personal liability. Land trusts avoid city codes. So how many of you own multiple rental properties? Anyone? A few of you? How many of you use trusts? Is anyone that doesn't use a trust, you own multiple property in a single company? That's the biggest mistake that, that investors make is they buy real estate in one company. How do I know it's a mistake? Guilty. So when I bought all my real estate, I incorporated them all into LLCs and realized down the line that they should have done land trusts. So it's very important to make sure that if you own multiple properties in the same county, you do not own them in the same entity because if you have a fire or something on one, a code enforcement issue on one, it now attaches to everything you own. Yeah, there are different, well, I mean, if you have them in separate entities, then you're fine. It's when everything is under one LLC. So you have your main LLC or your own individual name and you're just buying and selling real estate in that name. Now you open yourself up to exposure. Yeah, so we'll talk about that on the land trust slide, which I think is the next one. And judgments must be foreclosed out. We call for re-foreclosures several times a month because the bank did not foreclose out a money judgment because they only care about what? The house. So when they do their foreclosure, they don't actually pull a proper name search and realize there are money judgments. Most likely, if the person's going through foreclosure, they probably have other bad credit, credit cards, car loans. So it's very important. So what happens? What does the title company do when we raise the issue? They have to re-foreclose. But what if there wasn't someone advocating for the buyer? What do they do? Look the other way and just close. And now that judgment holder can now come back and put a claim to your property. That's how quick it happens. So if you have a credit card judgment, you bought a property and the owner that you bought it from in foreclosure had a credit card judgment, if the bank didn't foreclose out that credit card judgment, you now own the judgment and have to hope that you have title insurance to cover you. Refinancing is an important one, uh, but if you're refinancing, you can always call us. I'm going to speed through that one, uh, but we can handle whether you're refinancing or buying. All right, land trusts. So let's talk about land trusts. This one's very important when I gave the disclosure originally that I'm not an attorney. I'm not going to give you legal advice, accounting advice, but I'm going to teach you how I made the mistake to buy all my properties in individual LLCs. I set up each property in a separate LLC. And every year I paid what? A tax return, what else? Filing fees to the state of Florida, right? The annual renewal, whatever it is, $140. Insurance on every property, so I paid surcharges on every property, until I read a book called Land Trusts in Florida, and I said, well, I've been doing it wrong this whole time. I should have every property in a land trust with one LLC, one tax return, one corporate filing, one insurance policy. Save myself thousands of dollars every year. Very important. So let's talk about it. Land trusts and LLCs. So LLCs have what we call managers and members. I want you to write down LLC and then next to it write the word charging order and there's um, 
Corporate Creations, who's uh, an attorney that comes, he incorporates people, comes and gives a presentation where he talks about the benefits to having a multi-member LLC versus a single-member LLC. And there's legal reasons for that, talking about charging orders. If someone was to get a charging order against you and it's a multi-member LLC, they can't force you to sell that property and pay them. Where if you have a corporation and it's shares, and I own 50 shares, and let's say my wife owns 50 shares, and someone forecloses my 50 shares, what did they now become? Partners with my wife. That's the difference between LLCs and corporations. LLCs have membership interest, where corporations have shareholders. Big, big difference. Shares can be foreclosed on. Land trusts have trustees and beneficiaries. How many times we see people come to us and the trustee and the beneficiary are what? Same the same. Folks, if you're going to use a trust to buy property, just do it properly. Usually you're going to be the trustee and it's fine. You can have a corporate trustee if you wanted to and you pay a fee. Like the guy that wrote the land trust in Florida book does corporate trustee work for I think $350 a deal. But you can be the trustee individually. And who would be the beneficiary? Your company. So when we talk about hiding the exposure of who owns the property, if you have it in a trust, you could be the trustee, which is of public record, or a third party trustee of public record. And what's not of public record? The beneficiary. What's also not of public record? The trust. What doesn't file a tax return? The trust, no tax return. Who doesn't hold the bank account? The trust. Who owns the property? Good luck trying to find out, folks, when you're using land trust. That's the benefit of using a trust. Good luck finding out who the actual owner is without filing suit and going through a whole process of subpoena, sending a subpoena to the trustee and trying to get a copy of the trust. Is the trust recorded? Is the trust registered on Sunbiz? Does the trust have a tax ID number? Tax return. So that's the benefit. So imagine you're using a third party trustee and a land trust, you are 100% out of public record. Nobody would know what you own. If you're buying using a land trust and you use a third party trustee, like this company, uh, Mark Warda's company, he'll be the trustee. Now you've hidden yourself completely from public record. So does that mean you don't need to do some incorporation in Nevada? And, I mean, in LLC? That's a whole, yeah, and you know, it's a good question. So she's talking about incorporating in states that do not have public record like us. Nevada, um, Delaware are two that, that come to mind for me that most people incorporate. The reason for that is, furthermore, in your LLC, nobody would know who owns the LLC because it's not a public record. So that's an, another benefit to why people will use that. I always say it's depending on your level of paranoia. Because I know investors that buy and sell property in their own name. Thousands of properties in their own name. They don't care. That's how they do their business. And then some put it in a corporate entity. Some put it in a land trust. Some put it in limited partnerships. Depends how far down and how paranoid you want to get. Or how private you want to be. If you have, yes. If you have, you have to disclose. So, if somebody's really serious about going after you, they're going to figure it out anyways. Yes. Yeah, but the best part about land trust is they're not recorded anywhere. So nobody knows who has what. They could come to you, but at what point they get to you, most likely, you've sold that beneficial interest in the land trust long before they've even gotten to you. Because beneficial interest in land trust can be sold. You can sell them. So there's a perfect example why people do it. Because then if someone were coming after you, you could have sold the beneficial interest months ago. Nobody would know because it's not recorded anywhere. And that's the benefit. That's why most attorneys, uh, when Mr. Landtrust, who comes here and speaks, Randy Hughes, he always talks about the attorney that's getting paid hourly, will just keep going and he plugs in the people's names and nothing comes out of the typewriter because the person used trusts, where if they use their own name, he pulls the name and he sees all these 
properties the person owns says, give me a retainer, we'll sue them. And we'll win. When they see you have land trust, they don't even bother going after you. It's not worth it. They know they're never... If you're sophisticated enough to use a land trust, most likely they'll never get to you. You're sheltered. Usually you have multiple corporations, maybe in other states. So it's a very good tool. And dispersing the proceeds are the only time we disperse off the HUD because what doesn't have a bank statement? The trust, right? So we can disperse to the beneficiary of the trust, which would be your corporate entity, your LLC, your corporation. So then nobody knows that you're getting paid. Can, yes. Um, conventional financing, no. Private financing, yes. Hard money lenders will. Lima One Capital that comes here will. Lex does hard money loans for students uh, using the land trust, yes. They just make you as the owner sign the note. In other words, the personal guarantee to repay that loan. No, the note's not recorded. The mortgage is recorded. Some lenders require their note to be recorded, but usually it's not. So the trustee will sign the mortgage, which gets recorded, and the beneficiary will usually sign personally and on behalf of the company the promissory note that doesn't get recorded. So that's the power of hard money lenders using land trusts. So a land trust is an agreement. How much does a land trust cost to set up? Zero. zero. Who said zero? Zero. Land trust doesn't cost anything, especially if you're a student of Lexis. He teaches you how to do it. Uh, but it's just an agreement. It's a piece of paper between two parties. You and... You. <laughs> right? You and you. You and your company. So it's an agreement between you and you, and it doesn't get recorded. It's simple. There's a trustee and a beneficiary, which is you and you. So you talk to yourself at night and create them. Title is held with the trustee. The rights of ownership are held with you. You get the common theme here? You and you, but nobody needs to know. That's the whole idea of a land trust. So first, it's very, very private. Many of you ask that question, it's very private. There's no public record of your ownership. We talked about that, right? There's no corporation, there's no tax return, there's no Sunbiz filing, there's no nothing except the trustee. And if you use a third party trustee, then you've really sheltered yourself. Protection from liens, cross-contaminating liens, we talked about that, right? We talked about cross-contaminating code enforcement liens. We had a big case that we won where three underwriters and five attorneys told this one investor, you can't sell a property because this investor used his family name trust. So it was the family name investment trust on every property he bought. And the only saving factor was a closing we did is we would put the date of the trust. And that was the only factor that we can differentiate the two trusts. From the one that had the code enforcement issue to the one that didn't. Because the city said he owed it. Three underwriters and five title companies all said you owe it. It, it cross-contaminates to everything. And we said, uh-uh. Here's how a land trust works. They're separate trust agreements. They do not cross-contaminate. I don't care what the name says. And we got the deal closed. Imagine that. All because the trust had a date. So don't use the same name trust. Use a different name trust. Get creative with your trusts. Don't necessarily use the property address. One, two, three, four Main Street Land Trust. Get creative, right? But don't use the same trust because it doesn't cost any more to set up a new trust with a new name on a new property. Because once you set up your first one, you're fine. It avoids probate. So whether it's on your personal property you live in or on an investment property, the whole idea of using a trust is to avoid probate. We've seen it many, many, many times. And then all that probate does is turns into a battle for the family. So just put stuff in trusts, even if it's the house you live in. You can easily manage it. Avoid deed-restricted properties. This is another big one where investors are buying trusts. They're buying a property with a deed restriction. Could be on a short sale. And they're just either selling the company or they're selling the trust. And it doesn't trigger the, the due on sale clause because they're not selling the property. It's only one closing. So that's why a lot of them use these uh, for short sales. 
Investor partnerships. This is a big one. How, how many of you practice real estate but do not have a license? None of you are wholesalers that don't have a license? Uh, I beg to differ. One of the number one issues we see is wholesalers practicing real estate without a license now becomes a what? Does anyone know? A misdemeanor, maybe? What kind of felony? Third degree felony for practicing real estate without a license. So I'll give you an example. If he doesn't have a real estate license, and Lex has a property he put out on his list, and he calls Lex and says, Lex, I got a buyer for you. What did he just do? Committed a felony, folks, because he doesn't have a real estate license. But what if all of a sudden he calls Lex and says, Lex, I want to be a partner in your trust, and I have a buyer for you. What did he just become? A vested interest in the deal. Did he commit a felony now? No. And if I see the claims with the division of real estate of all the wholesalers I know, I put their names in, look them up. If you know any wholesalers in town, go to the division of real estate and put in their name for complaints and see how many are getting hit for unlicensed activity. And unless they can prove they were using a land trust or they had some type of vested interest in the property, they've committed a felony, which is why most of them do what? Get licensed. Most successful wholesalers will tell you it just got annoying to fight, so they just went and got their license. And now they double dip on deals. They get commissions and profit. So it has its benefits. Hard money lenders love it. So that's what the land trust looks like. So it would have a day, a date, a month, a year, a trust number or a name. Buy in between would be the trustee and the beneficiary and the legal description, and that's it. One page, sign, then the, the back pages are signed, witness, notarized and your trust is now set up. Sound simple? And very inexpensive. So my last question, this one's a little self-serving for us, but I like to ask because I, I, I want to drive home the reason Lex has been using us, his mentor used us, his students use us, any chance they have. And the question I have for you is, does the title company you're closing with actually have an office? Or do they have an executive suite somewhere with a common receptionist and they're never there. And it's important, guys, this, this is how you can tell if the company is up and running and reputable. Do they have a client base? Do they have Google reviews? Do they have people endorsing them? Do they offer you something of value? How many of you learned something today that you didn't know when you walked in the door? Okay? So they have to be able to offer you something of value. Do they look out for you or are they like the bank that we talked about that look out for who? The bank, right? Or if an attorney's doing a closing and representing the seller, is he really representing your best interest? I'm not saying they're going to do something wrong, but who hired them? Who's paying a legal fee and who are they representing? You want to make sure it's an independent third party. Do they have a website? And three employees is the important part. Do they have three employees or more? Why do I say that? Because investors call us and they say, oh, the attorney's out for lunch. He'll fund the deal when he gets back because there's only one person that can send wires. I know one title company that's very investor friendly, there's only two of them. And neither one has had a vacation in many, many, many years because you can't leave. So we have 13, 12 or 13 people at the office, four people that can fund, many people that can sign checks and, and disperse deals if needed. So it's very, very important to make sure because wholesaling is the art of the deal, we said. So you want to make sure someone is there ready to fund that deal because if that front side doesn't get funded, you could lose your deposit or start paying a per diem every day. So it's very important to make sure that they're quick, they're ready to go. And are they experts at what they do? So I'm going to end with this little message. You can write it down if you want. If you go to kevinsquotes.com, that's one of our number one uh, things that we do. We do a daily quote. Does anyone receive them here? So no, a few of you, Steve, you get it? So this is a daily quote that we do, and they look like this every day when they come into your email. It gives a quote and an action. Many, many people have been inspired and motivated, and it's free. You just go to kevinsquotes.com and subscribe. And then there's a double opt-in, because you have to put your email address and then click on an opt-in link that they'll email you. So this one I pulled. This was my message for 2017. Uh, it says, when I fail to go after what I want, 
I am what? What does it say? Never going to have it. So if you don't do something different today, you're never going to have it. When I fail to ask, the answer is always... So if you don't go to Lex and say, Lex, can you fund my deal? The answer is always going to be no. Lex, can you put up my deposit on this deal? If you're, one, if, he's one of your, if you're one of his students and it's a great deal, maybe he will. But if you don't ask and you lost the deal, who lost? You did. And when I fail to step forward, I'm always in the same place. Right? Because if you don't go out and do something different, you're no better off than when you walked in today. There are reasons. Where are Lex's students that are in the room? Look around for those of you that are not raising your hand. These are students that are going to be machines. Some of them are doing multiple, multiple deals every month because they care, they come here, they're consistent. Someone said to me, well, you don't even need to go to... I think it was you that said on the video, this guy Kevin, I see him at all these places, and he doesn't even need to go to these meetings. That's what you said on your, your testimonial. And the truth is, is it may appear I don't have to, but I do. Every single month I'm consistent. Consistently bringing in deals, consistently educating people, consistently closing transactions. So you need to be able to do the same thing by surrounding yourself with good people. So go out and do action on something that you want to do. If it's get a deal under contract, find a distressed seller, work on building your buyers list, work on getting your business cards if you have no business cards, work on something that can take your business to the next level. So a few things you can reach out. Title Tuesdays is the important one. There's the sign on the back that you can just text in if you want to join it. I have a gift for you, is that if you sign up for Title Tuesdays and email us when you get it next Tuesday, we do it every Tuesday, if you email me that you got the Title Tuesdays and you watch next week's episode, I will send you this entire PowerPoint, which I don't normally do. I don't like to release it. So if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, just subscribe to Title Tuesdays, shoot me an email on Tuesday saying, hey, cool video, and we'll send you the PowerPoint. But you can just go to our YouTube channel. This is all about education. So everything I talked about today, Marcelo over your, your back left shoulder there records me. And we record it and we put these videos out every single Tuesday on many, many different topics, lean searches, title searches. I get more in depth than I did here on certain topics. So if you want the free education, all you have to do is subscribe, hit the red subscribe button to the YouTube channel. If you already have it, I'll send you the slides. <laughs> I can verify. So that's how, if you want to text, you can just text the word title rate, one word, to the phone number 22828. It's a short code, a five digit short code. And we can help you after. I'll stay here and answer any questions. Uh, I'll stay here until the last person's done. And, uh, but you can text in. We don't spam messages. I get investment clubs email me daily saying, can you email out our event? Unless I'm speaking at it, I don't send it out. I don't just spam people. We want to make sure you get your newsletter and you get the content that you've subscribed for. Um, and then if you like what you saw today, I would appreciate, because remember we talked about reviews. So I would appreciate if you go to Facebook and Google, you can copy and paste the same comment in both. Give us a five star and uh, just a little kind word that you enjoyed what you heard here today because that's how we build our business is, is by helping you. Hopefully you learned something. You can go online and tell the world uh, what you learned. And that's it. Any questions for me? Any, and I can answer questions in private after too. But anyone? Okay, thank you. Get home safe, everyone. Hopefully you learned something and we'll see you at the next closing table.